Okay, so welcome everybody. This is the Bulletproof Bookkeeping webinar, August 12th, 2020. And uh, I'm glad Rob is here and was able to make it because today's topic is essentially his question, um, which I believe we did address in one of the other webinars as among others. But I wanted to make this its own sort of topic because I think it's a good one. I think the fact that when I sent out the email less than two hours before the webinar and seeing how many people immediately signed up, I'm guessing that's a reflection of the fact that this is something that appeals to a lot of people. And we're talking about how do you get experience in a new niche, right? This is another example of one of those things that we hear a lot of the, the what, but not nearly enough of the how, right? Everybody's saying, oh, you gotta be in a niche, you gotta pick, right? But nobody tells you how to do it. And my answer to that, just the first answer in terms of how to choose, which is not today's question specifically, but it definitely ties into it, is you have to not niche at first, right? You have to kind of go wide, try different things, see what you like, especially if you're brand new at this, you know, and a lot of that has, you know, will have to do with where you're coming from, right? You might go into an accounting or bookkeeping career already knowing, you know, maybe you came out of the industry that you're going to niche in, then it's easy. Your decision is kind of made by now, right? But if you're, you know, if you're going at it just as a bookkeeper who really kind of just started out wanting to do bookkeeping or accountant doing accounting, you may not have that kind of clarity yet. And so the answer that I have given when I developed the original 97 and up course a couple of years back, more than a couple now, I think it was like five years back. Um, one of the early lessons in that course talks about this. And I say, you know what, choose up to three, pick three to start with. And maybe there's no rhyme or reason between what you pick and how. It's just straight throwing a dart at the dartboard and saying, this is what I'm going to try and see if I like it, right? You can also think around, you know, just in general, think around your own life at large and think, what do you, what do you enjoy? Like one thing that got me really into real estate myself early on and really liking the idea of doing accounting for, you know, rental properties and property management and everything that shoots off from there. And then eventually that had... Um, a somewhat logical extension into doing real estate accounting for brokers and agents, although that's very different than rental properties and property management. It's still under the general heading of real estate. But I remember a conversation I had with a guy who was my client. He was one of my first clients and he had rental properties. And uh, there came a point in time where my, my wife, who then was my girlfriend, um, we wanted to get out of the apartment we were in and I, I knew he had properties. So I just reached out to him. I said, Hey, Ron, do you have any, properties available right now. My wife and I want to move. And, and he said, as a matter of fact, I do. And I remember we were standing in the, the first unit he showed us, which was the one we chose. We didn't need to look any further. And as he was kind of touring me around, it was clear how much pride he took in, you know, he had just finished fixing the place up, obviously, getting it ready for re-rental. And it was clear, not in the way he was trying to sell me or anything like that, but in the way that he was showing me the attention to detail, the fixtures that he chose and how he was very sort of excited about how he was able to get really good deals on, you know, the sconces and whatever else he was, you know, he had done to fix the place up. And what came out of it was how much pride he had in the idea that he had the opportunity to provide a living space for people and to provide an, a living experience for people that in his hope, obviously, was a very positive one. And to, to have somebody look at it and come from that perspective on it, as opposed to just, yeah, just I just want to rent the place and make money. Like, you know, the difference is this guy really cared. It just really inspired me and made me want to get more into the real estate world. And so that's, that's one of the early experiences, plus the fact that the, the real estate stuff, long story for another day, kind of fell into my lap uh, early on. But, um, but that, you know, so there's lots of different ways you'll choose a niche right? But let's say you choose or somehow you find yourself potentially having a niche fall into your lap because that was my thing is, so how do I get the experience, right? So actually come to think of it, I'll share the story of how I got into real estate because it perfectly answers this question of how do you get experience? And I want to qualify this, that a lot of, a lot of how you approach getting the experience and specifically one of my suggestions here is going to depend whether or not it will work for you is going to depend quite frankly on how much confidence you have in your abilities which is not to and it's it's this is not intended to shame anyone it's intended to get you to think right if you don't have a lot of confidence in your abilities and there's no shame in that because maybe you're new maybe you don't have a lot of experience yet and that's okay so what i'm trying to impress upon you is that this suggestion if that's where you're at may not be 
for you, but there's, I have other suggestions for you. So just bear with me on this, right? So here's what happened. I, I really just started looking to pick up bookkeeping clients. You know, I was living in a little apartment in Hollywood. And in those days, it was like 2003. I was using Craigslist, right? And I was, um, I was putting ads on Craigslist, but I was also going through the part-time sort of help wanted ads on Craigslist. And I found this one part-time ad um, from somebody who, the way they described it was that they, they wanted to hire somebody to help them support clients in bookkeeping for you know, for, for real estate, for rental properties. And I thought to myself, well, I don't have any experience with this, but here's where I, you know, I had enough experience by then to have the confidence that I could figure it out pretty quickly and easily. Right. And so I responded to the ad and said, Hey, I know you're, you know, based on the ad, you're looking to hire somebody, but if you're willing to sub it out, you know, I could do it. It'll save you some money on the employer taxes, whatever. And uh, so I met with the guy. And what happened is it was a, this guy and a woman had gotten together. The guy had written a book on how to use QuickBooks for a property, for, for rental properties. And uh, he got together with this woman, Holly, who was a teacher. And so they had formed this business going out there. And he was, he was giving presentations to apartment associations in Southern California. And what happened was a lot of the people who would attend these presentations would ask him about getting some one-on-one -on -one help after the, the classes. And he didn't want to do that. He just had no interest in doing one-on-one -on -one with people. And so that's what they were looking to hire somebody to do. So what happened is I, went, I, met, I met the guy at like a Starbucks. That's how we did the interview. And as we're talking and he's telling me about his book, I just started asking a lot of questions. And little by little, I got it out of him that the whole key to his process that he taught in his book was that you set up the properties as customers and the units as sub-customers, right? And, or this was in QuickBooks Desktop at the time, so we didn't call them sub-customers, we called them jobs, but same exact idea, right? That was pretty much all I needed to know for the whole picture to come together for me, right? And then, and so, so, so just having picked that little bit up, I was ready to do it. And then I get my first job and I go and it was the same guy, Ron, who this is how he became a client. So I go to his house and, you know, I'm going there to help him with some QuickBooks entries. And it was made pretty clear that he was bringing us on because his former bookkeeper didn't apparently know enough about how to do accounting specifically for rental properties. So I go in there and I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be easy enough. I go into his books and I start looking and all of a sudden he drops a HUD one down. And for those of you who don't know, HUD-1 is the closing statement that represents the purchase or the sale of a property. And he's like, I need you to enter this. I just recently bought a new building, a new, you know, a, a, it was a complex of rental units. And all of a sudden I'm sweating bullets. I'm like, holy cow, I don't know how to do this. I don't even know what a HUD-1 is, right? And I'm sort of internally and mentally panicking. And I'm like, I'm going to just, this company is going to fire me. This is my first job. It's going to be clear. I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm sweating bullets. And then I, I start going through it. And all of a sudden, I was immediately put at ease. Just deep breath, because there was a page in there. And right at the top of the page, right, it was clear on the page that there were these columns, and they were labeled debit and credit. And I was like, Oh, my God, this is perfect. My job is done for me. I know what a journal entry is, I can post the journal entry. And so I, I still had to kind of muscle my way through it a little bit. It was my first time. But the point is, I had enough of a foundation in accounting that I was able to figure it out. And I was even able to figure it out on the spot, on the fly. The only challenging thing was, you know, it wasn't immediately clear to me how to deal with the escrow monies that he received from investors that he had brought in. But again, knowing the accounting fundamentals really well by then, wasn't hard to figure out how to put that together. I just needed equity accounts to show the money that they had put in and that needed to go through the escrow account. So the point being, um, real estate found me in that way because I answered an ad and I took a chance, frankly. You know, the reality is the worst that could have happened is I would have embarrassed myself and they would have said, you know, why did you say that you knew how to do all this stuff? And I would have said, I'm sorry, I thought it was going to be easy enough to figure out. I was wrong. Um, but it turns out I was right. It was easy enough to figure out. So the point being that uh, one of the best ways to get the experience in a new niche is if you have the opportunity, throw yourself into the lion's den. There might be no better way to learn it, but that does require that you have a fair degree of confidence in your abilities already, at least in terms of knowing that you'll be able to figure it out. And the I'm truth is, and I've, I've taken on a, you know, work in a lot of different industries on this basis, is if you truly understand the accounting fundamentals, then one business to the next at the core isn't really all that different. And when you think about it, whatever niche you're looking at, 
it's really like when you understand things at the foundation, at the core, it's really like just putting a different skin on that, right? And here's what I mean. Any business, and let's assume for profit, right? Let's nonprofit is a whole different world, a whole different animal. So we're leaving that out of this conversation. If you want to niche in nonprofits or think you do, I have at least three people I can immediately think of that I can put you in touch with and they can mentor you and I'm sure they'd be happy to, which by the way is another answer to the question. How do you get experience in a new niche? Find somebody who's willing to mentor you. This community that we have right here in and of itself has plenty of people who I know would be only too happy. They'd be honored to have the opportunity. They'd be honored that you would even ask them to mentor them and help them out. Um, so that's the other way. But when you break down any business in the simplest terms and form, I sell something and I get value for it, right? Now, that's truly what it is. And that's, so let's focus on, on that revenue side of things for a minute. Because now I can plug any business in and then we start, like I said, that's the skin we put on top of that very basic concept, right? If I'm in the rental property market, I sell units. I sell units of apartments or homes that people rent. And so then you can start thinking around the situation. And what I do is I, I also, by the way, without them necessarily knowing it, because it's not as direct as me saying, hey, can you tell me how to do the accounting for your business? And the answer, of course, would be no. That's why I'm trying to hire you. But you talk to a business owner and you ask them a lot of questions about the operations of their business. And then you can interpret that into what the accounting should look like, right? So if I'm talking to, you know, somebody who, ha who owns rental properties, then I ask them some questions. All right, so, and you start with the obvious logical stuff, right? Okay, so I'm assuming when you have a place that's empty, you place ads, right? That's going to be an expense. I have to pay for some advertising to let people know that there's a unit available. Then I fill it. They sign a lease. And I know because I've rented apartments before what happens, right, from being on that side of it. I know that once I sign the lease, I'm going to have to give them a check. And that check is going to include very likely both a security deposit and the first month's rent, right? And so now I flip that around and I say, okay, so if I'm on the other side of that, my, that's what my revenue looks like in the first month, I'm getting security deposit and the first month's rent. Um, and the more that I start thinking this through and, and then I can kind of ask the owner questions aimed at getting a picture of how money flows into their business I can start thinking, all right, well, do I need invoices? Do I need sales receipts? Or is there some external system like in e-commerce companies that's tracking all the sales and now I need to create the piping to grab the data from a sales channel and push it into QuickBooks Online, right? So this is how I can start thinking through in the most literal way, how does the money flow into the business? And I know how QuickBooks works and I know how debits and credits work. And so I can figure out how to put the pieces together that put the picture together to make the accounting happen for any kind of business, just about, you know, unless we're talking maybe some super highly regulated industry. But, you know, I recently sat down with somebody who had an HVAC company as a client. I've never had an HVAC company as a client, but I've hired the comp HVAC companies to, to install an HVAC unit in my home. And I have an HVAC company that I pay money for a maintenance contract for so that they come in twice a year and, you know, seasonally just check that my heating's going to work as we're going into the winter and that the AC is going to work as we're going into the summer. So again, from having, you know, lived for a couple minutes on this planet and having some experiences that came with that, I can often think through very often being from being on the consumer side of it, what would this look like? And so as I'm sitting with, this is actually one of my Bulletproof CFO people. And she said, yeah, I've got this company that's got an HVAC, uh, you know, they're an HVAC company. And uh, I need to figure out how to lay out the, the plan that we're going to lay out for how we're going to get from where we are today to where we want to be tomorrow. And so I said, all right, let's whip out a Google spreadsheet. And let's see, I said, do they sell maintenance contracts? She says, no, they're actually a fairly new company growing like gangbusters. I've talked to them about that, but they're not doing that yet. And I said, okay, so as their CFO, you have to definitely tell them that they need to be doing that because that's going to help regulate cash flow, right? That brings in money on a regular basis as opposed to waiting for somebody to call. And that brings up the other two streams of income that I immediately identified. Again, just thinking through the logic of it, which is apart from doing maintenance contracts, what else can an HVAC company do? Well, they're going to do repairs and installations, right? And, I, and, and so I confirmed that with her and she said, yeah. And I said, great. Now I know exactly how to start laying out the revenue model for this company. And I said, now we need some data right? What is your average 
revenue per installation. What is your average revenue per repair job? And what is the average number of these services that you're doing each month, right? So when I think it through from that perspective, how do I get experience in a new niche? Sometimes it's as simple as thinking about it, especially if you understand the core accounting fundamentals. You understand from having been in the consumer world, you just have to kind of flip the script a little bit and jump onto the other side of that equation and you're thinking and think, okay, what would this look like being on the other side of it? And it's usually not that hard to figure out, right? Then, and then again, you just, and, and start visualizing what the balance sheet of the company should look like in the niche that you're in, right? Take a startup, right? A lot of people want to you know, use startups as their niche, which is fine. That can run the gamut across lots of industries, right? But we think of startups, we think primarily they're probably like, you know, software development companies, people who develop apps, right? That's a big part of the makeup of the startup world. Either way, when you start thinking that through that, and again, just using the basic logic, even if you have no actual experience with it, where does their money come from? Anybody want to take a stab at what I'm thinking in terms of where does most of the money come from in a startup? Greg, you're Invest unmuted. Investor money. There you go. Right. Venture capital, which is very different. Now it's not a revenue model, right? When it's a venture capital model, then we have to start asking the, uh, the, the founder of the startup that we're probably talking to at some point when we're considering this, what's the structure of that? You know, you, all right, so you got some series A funding, which by the way, is, it's a fancy sounding term. It just means it's their first round of funding that they got. And usually it's significant and usually it's a big milestone for, for a startup to reach. Um, but that money has to come in and it's either, it's, you know, most, most investment deals are struck. Well, actually all of them have to be structured one of two ways. Either it's an equity deal or a debt deal, right? In simple terms, either it's a loan or they're getting a piece of the company in exchange for that. Sometimes it's a hybrid between the two. So you first have to understand the structure so that when, when you get that deposit of, of one or eight or $10 million or whatever it is, you have to know how to record that. So again, you have to think, you have to think like an accountant and say, all right, what would I do with that money? The other thing that now has to be taken into consideration, and this is where we get into some stuff that's more advanced than what your typical bookkeeping engagement covers. So that's why you want to learn also to put on that CFO cap is we need a projection or a forecast of some sort, because if we just got $10 million and we have the rest of the financial picture in place, we need to know what's the, what's the burn rate. In simple terms, again, how long is that money going to last at the rate we're going? And what is our plan to, you know, eventually start bringing in cash flow based on revenues and not based on uh, financing activities? So, so that's, those are just some of the thoughts that I have at kind of the top of my head about how you get an experience in a new niche, you know. And just to recap what I've covered so far, one is throw yourself into the lion's den and just force yourself to learn it and work through it. Right. Some I've talked to a lot of people and, and almost in some cases because I've suggested it specifically is you might take the client on for a lower than normal rate, let's say, or lower than what you might normally be inclined to charge and be honest with them and say, look, I'm I've never worked with a company in your industry before, but I'd really like to. And so I'm willing to work at a reduced rate in exchange for your patience with me while I'm learning and I'm going to learn on you. I had years ago, that's how I got into e-commerce specifically. It wasn't even, it wasn't even exactly with that tone. I was sort of being put under duress to come into e-commerce because this one client kept coming back to me. He's like, I know you're the guy. I know you can do it. And I'm like, it's not my thing. It's a very complicated area. There's a lot of things involved. And so finally, and then I went and started talking to some people who I knew to be e-commerce experts. And I'm like, look, we can split the client. You can handle the e-commerce parts. I'll handle, handle every other part of the GL. And they were all like, I'm up to my eyeballs. I don't, I would love, one actually told me, look, I've followed you on Twitter and YouTube for years. I would love nothing more than an opportunity to work with you, but I'm up to my eyeballs. I just, I can't take it on if I wanted to, which of course told me something, you know, in terms of how to pick a niche. Here's another way how to pick one it was basic supply and demand. There was clearly a huge demand for accountants who can serve clients in the area of e-commerce and a very short supply, which in translation means you can charge a lot for it. 
So I went back to this guy eventually. And I said, okay, look, here's the deal. I don't actually have experience with e-commerce, but obviously I understand how inventory works and I'm pretty good at understanding how things work online. My own company as an accounting firm has pretty much morphed into like an e-commerce version of an accounting firm. My own accounting clients, even by then, and this was already years ago, were, were not getting invoices and paying them after the fact they were going on a subscription through my website and their card was getting charged monthly and it was all done through my website. So I had basically created the e-commerce version of an accounting firm, you know, in that sense. So again, I can think through the sort of piping of things, how stuff connects and how it has to come from one place and go somewhere else and figure it out. So I told him point blank. I said, look, if you really want me to do this, then you have to understand I'm going to be learning on you. And yet, and in his case, I said, and yet, you're going to pay me full price. It would be different if it was something I was looking to do, but, but the script on that was flipped a little in that he really wanted me to come and do it. So I said, basically, you're going to pay me full price and I'm going to learn on you. And he said, fine. He says, I have that much confidence that you, you can do it. He had been through several bookkeepers who made a mess of his books. I was able to confirm that easily enough by digging in. I mean, you want to talk about a mess? This is like something I'll bring up this coming Halloween when we do our yearly scary bookkeeping stories, because I don't think I ever shared this, but the, 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 when I dug into his books and the bookkeeper was apparently trying to reconcile his PayPal account, she was just like stuffing things in deposits to force them to match what actually had cleared his PayPal account. And so I had transactions from like September of a year that were grouped into and recorded and reconciled inside of deposits from March of that year. So either she could see the future somehow or it was a mess. And, and I was, anyway, so the point being, I, I, you know, I was able to confirm it was a mess. I was, I, I could understand why he was, you know, so frustrated that he didn't want to trust anybody else with his books. And the reason he trusted me so much was, was twofold. One, he had seen my videos on YouTube, which is why I always tell people go make videos on YouTube because it serves to do exactly what it did in this instance, which was to prove to him that I knew what I was doing, even if not specifically in the area he needed. He had so much confidence that I knew what I was doing in general that he knew I could figure it out and that I would be able to do a good job. The other piece was he was he came by way of referral from another accountant who highly, highly, highly recommended me. So that never hurts. But so there's lots of ways you can pick a niche. Um, and so, and especially if it's one that you went out and proactively picked, then getting the experience in it should almost come naturally as a byproduct of the fact that you're excited about doing it, that you want to learn, right? And that's the other thing. And if you're not excited like that, if you're not excited so much that you really want to learn how to do the accounting for that niche, then it may not be the best choice of niche for you, right? So you have to ask yourself, why do I want this? Why am I doing this? Right, Greg, what are your specialties? What do you sort of specialize in, in terms of niches for your accounting firm? I am in the process of doubling down on construction right now. I only have a couple of clients right now in the bookkeeping realm, but I'm more focusing on the CFO realm. Okay, why construction? It, it's, it's an industry that, that I understand and I know a lot of people in that industry, but I, I don't particularly have a good reason aside from, from because that. It's there. I mean, right. It's, it's there. It's a popular uh, category. You know, it, there's, there's lots of construction companies, no matter where you go in the country, mm -hmm. there's, there's always going to be, small construction I'm not looking for the, the mega million construction companies building 40 uh, story skyscrapers. I'm also not looking for the guy with a hammer. So right. I'm no, you're for, like probably talking about like guys doing like companies doing like rehabs and flips and that kind of thing, right? Exactly. 10 to, to 20 uh, employees probably is, is a good, is a good, um, indication for me that that's that that's a good one for me to go after because they are then not too small and not too big for my $2,500 a month package. So you know what I heard in that by way of the answer to my specific question about why? You said it. You just didn't say it as directly as this. Because there's money there. Well, okay. So underneath that, sustainability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You said it's always going to be there, yeah. right? That's the reason I went into accounting. 
was because my father encouraged me when I was when I was going back to school and trying to figure out should I do finance or accounting because I was coming off of Wall Street. And my dad was like, well, if you go for accounting, you'll always be able to find work, right? right? Now we're within the framework of accounting and that's a very good reason to pick something. Um, you know, and hopefully you'll actually enjoy doing the accounting on it too because it gets interesting, right? Yeah. You know, and I, I used to years ago, it was it, construction was one of my areas of specialty. Um, and the reason I chose it was similar to the reason I ultimately liked the idea of going into e-commerce because it was a more complicated area than most, which again meant supply and demand. Not a lot of people willing to do the accounting in these industries, therefore you can charge more, right? So those are good reasons. And so how did, so Greg, how are you getting experience in construction? And another question I wanna throw out there on that is, cause this can be another reason why you wind up getting into a particular niche and, and also it ties into how you can get experience in it is maybe you ran across one of the popular construction apps like Noify or Co-Construct or Builder Trend. And maybe somehow looking at that app inspired you cause you said, hey, it looks like this app is gonna make it really easy for me to work in this industry. Right. But what, so what specifically inspires you about doing construction apart from what you've already said? What specifically inspires me about doing construction? I don't know that I have any one specific reason, but I will tell you that, that I am, a, first of all, what am I doing to, to you get the experience? Yeah. Get the experience. I'm here. I'm I'm here to, I'm here in this in this court in this uh, webinar you know talking about how to niche down basically and and so you know I I know that there's still a long road ahead of me um, and it but it's all also only going to take one for me to get good at what I do right because you have enough experience doing accounting in general yes that like I was saying at the beginning you'll know how to put the pieces together yeah. right. And even if I have to take care of my father-in-law's books and, and do Oh, his. so that's a piece of information. So your father-in-law is in construction, so. Yes, but he, he's, he's very not much an ideal client for me. Right. But I might have to, you know, lay on the, lay on the sword, so to speak. Right. In order to, um, in order to just pay my dues, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm also of the mindset, um, you know, we've talked about this before in 97 and up about um, burning the ships. Mm -hmm. So I'm going all in and let's, let's do this shit. I love it. I love it. Tracy, you're kind of specialized in real estate. How did that happen? And how'd you get the experience? <laughs> it kind of fell in my lap. How? So, um, can you share? Sure. Yeah, I'm uh, part of a small group of people. I was working for another person and he hired someone to help um, in the in the firm. And then um, she ended up uh, thinking I, I could do I did a good job. And then she suggested to one of her friends who was in the similar group that um, needed an accountant and there there I was. And so that's kind of how I fell into it. And um, ended up really liking the group of people and so that kind of excited me about getting doing more with it because I liked them um, and then saw that they were using an accounting program that was way too expensive so I hopped online and started researching and found you there aren't too many out there that have any anything out there to help learn real estate in QuickBooks but found out I could do it for them for you know eight hundred dollars less than what they were paying mm -hmm. um, and then that just kind of where it went and it's yeah, just so, from there so that's a perfect example of how you flew under the radar a little bit so that you could get the experience you made it sort of worthwhile to them to let you train on them did you tell them were you were you transparent with them about the fact that you're learning on them or did it not matter oh no i told them i was like i'm i i can i can do books but this is new and this is what I found out. And they actually started me in this other uh, program. And I was like, this is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and I told them, I was like, this is awful. This is horrible. I'm like, you're paying me to do this, but this should be something that, you know, anyone can do and they can't. So let's, let's try this way. I love that. I, I honestly think the best thing you can do 
is be brutally honest with people. Yeah. I think most people will find it refreshing. The fear is going to be that they're going to say, oh, I don't want to have you do it. You don't have any experience. And the truth is they'll find it so refreshing that you're willing to be that transparent and honest with them. That alone will make them want to take a chance with you. You know, it really will. I truly think, I know it's cliche, but I truly think honesty is the best policy. Just be honest with people. Say, look, if you're willing to take, take a chance on me, I'm willing to take a chance on you. I want to learn. I'm willing to work for a little less than what others might charge in, order, in exchange for that experience. You know, will you do that? And that is something that I did too, is um, they know I'm work, um, working for less than what I would, I would like to charge. Um, less than what they'd like to actually pay me. So they right. mentioned that when I gave them my, my offer. Um, and I said, I'm willing to do that now because you're a new business and you're getting started. And this is, these are all the things I need to do for you. Um, and then they, they said, you know, as soon as we can, we're going to increase you and um, increase responsibilities. And they're even talking about having me like run their whole accounting department and being in charge of people. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And that's what the honesty does is they'll be very fair with you. Right. That's perfect. And because then, then it opens up the door for you. And if they didn't bring it up, you could have brought it up and said, Hey, look, you know, when we started, I told you I was going to work for less than than normal because I was learning. Well, now I've learned like perfect time to do it is you, you get the books cleaned up. You kind of get going, you know what you're doing now and you schedule a call with them, get on zoom, share your screen and review their balance sheet with them and get them to confirm every step of the way through the balance sheet, how beautiful and accurate everything looks. And that's the perfect time to then say, okay, now I think I've demonstrated, I know what I'm doing. I've proven myself, you know, do you mind uh, if we increase the rate a little bit, you know, if not up to par completely, but somewhere in between at least, you know, now that I've proven myself, I would think it would be almost impossible for somebody to say no to that. It would be unreasonable for them to say no to that, you know, especially when you've had an honest and open enough dialogue with them that they've already acknowledged and they, you know, that you were working for less than what you normally should be charging for it. Right. Yeah. So that to me is the best way is to just dive in, throw yourself into the lines, then reach out to that prospective client who's in the niche that you want to get the experience with and get it with them that way. The other thing that I think um, hopefully all of you have heard that came out of this sort of as a byproduct of what, you know, myself and Greg and Tracy have said so far is, you know, you can go on YouTube. Right. You can go on YouTube and, and maybe in real estate, it's slim pickings, but Tracy found me that way. Right. And then I hope you don't mind me sharing. Tracy hired me for some one-on-one -on -one to help support her and give her and just make sure, right? Was it worth it? <laughs> and be absolutely. honest, if it wasn't, I can take no, it. No, absolutely, because I didn't have a clue. I was right. like, this is not working right. And I'm watching the videos, but I just need someone to say, yes, you're doing it right. Right. So again, oh, you know, I said, sorry. Um, earlier, I mentioned that you can find a mentor and just because you're thinking of it as finding a mentor doesn't mean you can't pay somebody to get some very specific one-on-one -on -one help, right? And I'm not saying this to promote me. I don't have to be the one you hire. Um, Yvette, are you, are you with us right now? I know you're here. I know you're muted. Yes, I'm here. Sorry. I was <laughs> Perfect. No, no worries. Um, so you used to have restaurants as your niche. I know you've walked away yeah. from that. You First know, of all... I wanted to say something about that because when you said something about how you kind of just um, learned, you know, out of the blue and you really didn't know how to do some of it, um, that's kind of what happened with me with restaurant bookkeeping. Um, the story is, is that I got like one or two restaurant clients because at the time I was desperate for business. And um, so I took everything that came my way at the time. And when I got the restaurant account, I told the owner, I said, you know, I'm not too familiar with this, but I think I could figure it out. Well, they had a franchise business and it was way over my head. And one day I started saying, okay, I got to get somebody that will help me do this because I can't figure it out. So one of the moms at my daughter's Irish class dance, um, her husband specialized in restaurant bookkeeping, but he didn't like having his own business or anything. So she told me, you should call him. So I called him. Long story short, he ended up working for me for about three, four years, but he did all the restaurant bookkeeping and he could do it like nobody's business. 
and he would tell me, you should, you should sit down and see what I do just in case, you know, and I tell him, well, I don't have time, blah, blah, blah. Well, one day he had a nervous breakdown. Mm -hmm. He called me up and he told me he couldn't work with me anymore. He was going through some, some um, personal problems at home. And he said, you could just come and get, you know, cause he, at that time we, he would print all the payroll reports from the restaurants and put everything in all the sales reports, you know, all this, um, all the um, sales receipts and everything that he would put into QuickBooks. And let me tell you, I thought I was going to just sink. So I was having a nervous breakdown. <laughs> I came home and I just told myself, calm down, pretend that this is a forensic accounting mm -hmm. <laughs> and just follow the trail. It right. took me a few weeks, but boy, I even learned how to do the accruals for the payroll. And they had so many employees, but when I figured it all out and everything reconciled, I felt like so good because I did it by myself. And that's like what Seth has said to us, as long as we know accounting, if we take the time and if it's something we really wanna do, we can learn it. You know, um, I got so good at it that I had so many restaurant clients in San Francisco. And what happens with these restaurant clients in the city, they own what they call properties. And each property is a restaurant. And once you get in with one of them and they see that you're good, they take you on for all the other restaurants and they pass the word on between other restaurant owners. So at the time I had probably 85%, 80 to 85% of my revenue came from restaurant bookkeeping and I was making a lot of money, but it was constant. Restaurant bookkeeping is constant. I mean, it, and, and to find and train people, that was hard. And I just couldn't do it myself anymore. And I'm thankful that I let go of the restaurant bookkeeping because today with this COVID thing, <laughs> If 85% of my revenue came from that, I don't know what I'd be doing. <laughs> right. So that, you know, I just wanted to share that with you. And now I'm at the stage, well, I don't know a niche. I mean, I do construction. I've been doing construction for a long time. I like construction and I'm thinking of taking on like a broker, real estate brokers. You know, um, I just don't want anything too, too, uh, time involved right yeah and that's another way to go like i've been saying in a couple of cases i've chosen industries that were complicated because of the resulting supply and demand model from that but the other way to go is do simple service-based businesses because mm -hmm. you can automate the crap out of those right just do bank feed rules on steroids like greg recently showed everyone in 97 and up you know just really go to town creating rules that substantially automate the whole bookkeeping process so really in a case like that you can set up a, a, a stream of revenue where you don't need to spend much more than about 15 minutes a week just keeping it all up and you can and you can charge lower fees you can compete with qb live right charge five six hundred dollars a month even less in some cases yeah, i even thought of taking on like handymen and painters right uber drivers right yeah although they're not getting much work right now no <laughs> uber just says that they're going to be uh, shutting regarding, down in california but regarding real estate i i know you know there's very low inventory yeah. and commercial real estate is not moving anymore I mean, I know the vultures will come Commercial, in. Commercial, no, but residential seems to be going gangbusters from what I see. There's no inventory. That's what I'm hearing, at least around this area. There's no inventory in residential. I, mean, oh, I thought you said commercial. Yeah, commercial is, there's a slew of commercial, but it's not moving because people can't. Well, commercial, nobody's going to rent right now because they're, they're, you can't go to the office in most cases. Right. Everybody's going home. So if anything, it's going the other way. But the, the residential realtors that I work with out here, most of them are doing very well. Yeah, you know, they're, they, they have processes for how to safely social distance while people are going through homes that are on the market. There are plenty of homes on the market and, and they're doing very well. So again, here, I'm hearing there's no inventory for them. 
Right. Well, then you're in Tennessee, right? Yeah, I'm in Tennessee. And so, you know, if you want, there's all plenty of high end big properties. Mm -hmm. But it's the that middle sweet spot properties that there's no inventory. Yep. And it's funny you mentioned that I've seen this too over the years, high end properties are completely recession proof because you're not dealing in a demographic that is affected by recessions of any kind, right? So it makes sense. So if you're like, watch, go watch Million Dollar Listing, right? Those guys are still making millions and millions of dollars because that's who their market is, right? If you, you know, we have the guys out here from the one that's based in Los Angeles and, you know, uh, Josh Altman uh, recently showed he had a property listed. It was like hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, this amazing property in Malibu that's modeled after the home from uh, Tony Stark in the Iron Man movies. I don't know how many of you saw that, but if you remember the home that he lives in that's overlooking yeah. the water, this home, I believe, is modeled after that home. It looks almost yeah. like it's exactly like it. And, and he has the listing for it. And that kind of real estate, it doesn't matter, recession or not, because the people who are buying and selling that don't care because they have hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank. It doesn't make a difference to them. But uh, Greg, I'm sorry, you started to say something. I thought. Did I? I, I thought you that. did. <laughs> so it's I, hard to find a niche, though. I, you know, because I've always I've become such a generalist. Yep. You know, um, I don't know. I just don't know what. I just like simple things or things that are familiar. Yeah. Yeah, look, a, a lot of the times, if you have a niche, it's going to fall in your lap, or you're going to be a generalist until you stumble on something that you're like, you know what, I really like this, right? Mm -hmm. And then what's the, the benefit of having a niche is, and we've been talking about this a lot in 97 and up too, um, is from the marketing perspective, it enables you to get very narrowly focused on whom you're sort of going after. Um, and it, so you can create very direct and specific messaging that targets that audience of people so that when you go out there trying to find those clients, you know, whether it's through any, well, any kind of marketing messaging, or even if you're just talking to somebody, that language starts to come out naturally that, that, that addresses the specific audience you're going after. And then it has a way of resonating more with them, right? Um, so a lot of that also is going to drive you know, a, a lot of what may drive your niches and how you actually get your clients, right? If you're like Yvette, I know you have really good local SEO. And so you get a lot of incoming traffic looking. Yeah. Um, so you don't need to worry about the specific targeted focused messaging. But if somebody wants to go after a niche, if I want to, you know, like actually just yesterday, I sat down because I was, and I'm, I'm just sort of speaking very transparently here. So I kind of, I've, I've reached the point where, you know, the, the whole Bulletproof platform is maturing nicely exactly the way I wanted it to between this and the Bulletproof CFO. I've got really good momentum going. Um, and so I've wanted for a while to get to the point where I can start developing a course on QuickBooks Online for real estate brokers specifically. I've had such a call for that from, you know, brokers themselves who are out there who've seen the videos that I've done on the subject. And they're like, you know, do you have a course yet? So I started kind of laying the framework for building that whole platform around it. And, you know, right away I'm thinking, okay, this is a very narrow niche. Cause I, you know, I, a lot of the content I did previously was focused on both brokers and agents. And I said, Nope, I'm going to narrow it down even further and speak directly and only to brokers. And I could do the agents next. Right. Cause once I've got the platform built for the brokers addressing the agents has, there's a few other nuances that the brokers don't have to deal with and vice versa that I can address. And I can almost say, sign up for the real estate brokers course. And then, you know, here's an add on for agents, you know, with the extra stuff that the agent needs to be concerned with. Um, but the point is that it, it enables me to get very focused on my marketing. If that's the way I'm getting my clients is by going out more sort of intentionally and saying, I'm going to go after this group. I mean, heck, even for the local SEO event, you could theoretically build a campaign if you wanted to, I'm not saying you have to, but if you wanted to, you could build a campaign in your local SEO where you put things into your, you know, your Google places profile or whatever else it is that you're using um, that speaks to those audiences specifically. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yep. And then, so Megan, I'm reading Megan in the chat and Greg. Okay. So Greg, we did figure out what you started to say that Uber said it was leaving California. For kind of re uh, revamping because the, the state has determined that uh, 
all their drivers are employees, so they have to. Oh, them. okay. So that's yeah, yeah. That makes <clears throat> sense because they don't want to deal with that whole mess of being not being independent contractors, which makes sense. Apparently, Joe Rogan's also leaving California because he's tired of the politics here. Um, and then Megan says it's a great idea to aim at the brokers and then do the agents as kind of an add-on. The uh, the other benefit of aiming at the brokers is there's a very good likelihood that the brokers that I address will refer agents to me. Mm -hmm. Right. That's so, how I'm growing is the brokerage, the head brokerage, and then they've got brokerages underneath that partner with the main brokerage. But then I just started doing all the other brokerages. Mm -hmm. So, um, Seth, how did you get into the brokerage? How'd you get that? Your that happened by accident because uh, you want to hear the actual story how it started it's a funny story actually because like i said earlier i was originally focused specifically on property management and i had property owners and then management companies that i worked with but really that's totally different from brokers and agents but what happened was and it's kind of funny it, it sort of came out of left field it really wasn't actually tied in now that i think about it to the fact that i was already working in another area within the general heading of real estate what happened was I, I got a call from a, a manufacturing company and this was going back to when I did a lot of construction work. And so I dealt with the construction inventory and that led me to do some videos on QuickBooks desktop for inventory. And that led to calls from lots of other sort of tangent type businesses who had to deal with inventory. So anyway, got a call from this one manufacturer and they had a challenge in terms of how to, um, how to kind of address the way things were placed on the invoice. And it had to do with, I, I ended up actually on a support call with somebody from Intuit who gave me the idea, which I then extended into the broker model. And here's what it was. I forget the actual context of the original like problem I was trying to solve, but the bottom line, line is he suggested that the way this particular business model was working, um, he, we needed to put the sort of volume related to the transaction in the quantity column and then put a percentage in the rate column to generate the total. And it hit me immediately. Like this is what anybody running on, this is what a real estate broker should do. It quickly extended in my mind to a real estate broker sells a home. I had by then talked to some who said their challenge was they really wanted to be able to get reporting that showed how much the homes that they had sold had sold for. And we couldn't show the whole like million five hundred thousand dollars that the home sold for as their income, right? Because that's not right. That's not their income. Their income is whatever percentage of that they earned as a commission. And so it quickly extended in my mind just the, the chip sort of lined up right when I was on that support call that was totally unrelated. But once I got that idea, and in those days especially, I was hungry for ideas for things I could do videos on. It didn't matter. There was no niche for me. It was, if I can do a video that explains how to do something that a lot of people may or don't know how to do, I, I'm going to do a video on it. And so I immediately got to work creating a video that says, hey, here's how you can track it. Because by then, QuickBooks Desktop had rolled out the reporting functionality where you can get totals on the quantity column. For a long time, you couldn't get that. There was no way to total the quantity column in a report in QB Desktop. But they had by this time added that in. So I said, okay, so I can, I can create an invoice where the amount that the home sold for goes in the quantity column, their commission rate goes in the rate column and it'll calculate the commission perfectly. And then I can get the reports and I can show by listing exactly how much the home sold for and get that totaled. So, so that's how, Yvette, that answers your question actually. That's how I got into that because of course, once I start doing videos on a topic like that, guess what happens next? Yeah people call and say, Hey, I saw your video and I had this specific question and boom, boom, boom. And, and that's how I ended up making a lot of money over the years doing one-on-one -on -one live support type training years ago when nobody else was doing it. I, it just made sense. And it was a way of making money that I enjoyed. I really enjoyed logging in with people and helping them. That's and, good. you know, and so that's, that's how I got into that specifically. And that's how I got into, I got, you know, I, a, a little bit away from just doing bookkeeping for companies and into the training side of things specifically was because the videos were inviting people to come and ask me and say, I don't need to outsource my bookkeeping. I'm not looking to hire anybody to do it. I just need somebody to teach me how to do it. Sure. You know, and I love that. That's, that's exactly why we're all sitting where we're sitting right now at this very moment is because my whole experience kind of just led me that way. And that's the other thing is, you know, sometimes it'll just be your sort of organic experience that takes you down a path that gets you into a niche and getting the experience you need to serve that niche just kind of comes out as a byproduct of simply you're wanting to do it. 
Yeah, I just looked up um, real um, bookkeeping services for real estate brokers. Mm -hmm. And and to it has an ad for uh, QuickBooks Live. Of course they do. Do you know how many clients I've gotten this year who are QuickBooks for real estate, who are brokers, who went to QuickBooks Live and they made a complete mess of it because the people who are doing that bookkeeping work for Intuit, they don't have, experience. They don't have the niche experience and they really don't understand the real, real estate business model. So I've gotten many calls in the last couple of months from, from people in that exact situation. In fact, there's a way to go target a niche. You can start putting posts up there. It might have set into it a little bit, but oh well, Intuit has done their share of upsetting us by actually even offering that service. So why not go out there and post a headline on Facebook, LinkedIn, or elsewhere that says, hey, are you a real estate broker who tried QuickBooks Live and found your books to be a mess? You know, give us a call. We'll clean it up for you. It's a great way to target somebody who's experiencing that exact frustration. Carolyn? What I'm finding is my live support training is getting me more calls than accounting and bookkeeping. And then I'm adding to it the knowledge of how it's taxed, especially for single member LLCs. I mean, again, it's not, it's not a big dollars. The knowledge of how what's taxed. Like uh, understanding that a Schedule C is getting taxed on their bottom line for Social Security and oh, Medicare, right, right, right. Okay. paying that all. And so I'm, I'm teaching them how to do the accounting for their business, but then I just naturally go into how it's taxed because mm -hmm. they ask me, how do I do the tax? And that seems to be evolving into something. I mean, right. I, I'm, yeah, I'm just letting it grow naturally or organically or what people are asking me for. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really interesting because it's not what I thought. Right, right. Yeah, I don't it's... know the taxes, but I can tell you how it works. And I can explain to you how it works and how it looks on your balance sheet and how you know, it, it's, it's just very interesting. It's not what I expected. Mm -hmm. So, Carolyn, love... how are you, I'm sorry, how are you, um, how are you structuring or delivering that service? Is it um, something you... Carolyn, give her your website because I've seen your website. She does it on her website. She does a beautiful job, but I'm yeah, sorry, Carolyn. I'll let you really answer nice. the question. I'll yeah, so I just have live support. You can buy one hour. I do a mm -hmm. video recording. I have Otter and I translate the uh, transcripts. I type up notes and I share that link with you. Or you can mm -hmm. buy five hours and I do. I discount it. It's exactly okay. how I do it. Did you Everything copy my model? Say that. <laughs> Exactly what Seth does, and I do it. And okay, and and I have people calling me. They don't want to do the bookkeeping. They want to know yeah. this. And I'm yes. Going to date you. And okay, I I'm excited. I was going to say. Go ahead. <laughs> this is out of my score mentoring, because I'm spending hours talking to people, and they say, "Can I hire you?" I'm like, "No, you can't hire me." But then, it and and then I got hooked up with the small business development center and that's what i'm doing for them i'm just standing over their shoulder click here click here click here right and i it, it's just it, it's interesting i want it to grow more and i'm trying to grow it more right. but it's something that i didn't think people would yeah want. yeah I, i'm kind of experiencing a similar thing too i'm noticing people um you know, like they want to, well, I shouldn't say everyone, but some people have come to me and they are a little bit comfortable doing their own books. They just kind of want somebody to look over what they're doing and kind of confirm, you know, they're doing things right. And so I started thinking too, I'm like, okay, so I need to, maybe I need to do Go on like, website. <laughs> okay, right, so Courtney, put in the request, both here mm -hmm. and in 97 and up for us to do a, some sessions on how to build a training model into your business. Yes, that would be, that would be great. You can definitely do that. Um, I was uh, actually, Rob Hopes, I see you there with no camera and the mute on. Um, if you want to unmute, we have like 60 seconds left. Technically, we have negative 120 seconds left, but I would love to hear from you since this was your question um, in terms of any kind of a reaction to what we've gone over this hour. All right, the mute is off.
it doesn't sound like we're getting an audio feed. He says, he's, so he's writing in the chat, great stories and info. Okay, well, then we'll wrap it up. Rob, of course, you can ping us in Slack if you have any kind of follow-up questions. That goes for everybody, of course. And don't forget to use the form to submit your topic questions for the webinars that we do. Um, we have another free weekly Bulletproof webinar next week. And then the following week is our monthly members only Q&A. So definitely get your questions in for that because those get posted in the course that's on the site. Which, by the way, if you're trying to access today, it appears uh, Kajabi is on the fritz. Um, maybe they fixed it now. But while we were talking earlier, a couple of people messaged me saying they were having trouble accessing courses, but no, I'm in there now. It looks like it's working. So never mind. But if you do run into a weird kind of error page that says there's too many requests, just know that that's something that's being worked on as we speak. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I'll get this recording posted up in the nerd buzz section of the website as soon as possible. And uh, again, you know where to find me. If you need me, have any questions, if I can help with anything, um, and let's just keep the conversation going as always in Slack. I love the way everybody's jumping in the Slack workspace. I'm really glad I decided to make that move from the other community that I initially had. This Slack seems to be working much, much better. And don't forget Friday, Teams versus Slack with me and Matthew, right? Mm -hmm. On the Friday Zooming with Seth. And this just in literally like 20 minutes before this webinar. For those of you who know she, who she is, I have Misty Mejia who's oh, going to moderate the event. Really, Misty? Misty is going to, she's going to be the referee. So she's going to moderate oh, the whole event yeah, on huh? Friday morning. She's going to take over as MC and she's going to run it for us. Wow, I got to see that one. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Misty is incredible. I can't wait. So I'll see you all around. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.